Falling short. Issues of Uncle Jay. So, Joseph, how are things? Asked Chris, my line manager, a soft-spoken Englishman in his 60s, who, like the rest of the board, isn't around for the day-to-day -day operation, but touches base with me every month. All in all, things are good. The youth centre is delivering fun and educational sessions every day of the week, and the work I'm doing in schools is going really well, I answered. So what's happening with Taylor? Taylor is still coming in late, or sometimes not at all, without giving me any notice, and is just unwilling to play ball despite all the support I'm offering. Do you think maybe collaborating with him will get him on board? Asked Chris. Chris, have you been reading any of my documents I've been sending you? Yes. So after reading the fact that Taylor undermined me in front of young people and staff, seeing the email he sent me after the fact, then now unable to escape the fact that he doesn't come to work on time or at all, you are telling me that you think the next step we should take is to offer him the chance to start a project with me where he would have part leadership? I just think maybe he needs a little motivation. He's taking the mick and your response is inviting him and others to take advantage of this charity. I see what you're saying, but sometimes we need to support people. Supporting people is different to enabling foolishness. So what do you suggest? An official meeting where we ask him to fix up or move on? That's a bit harsh. All I'm asking is he turns up on time and hand in basic admin evidence in his work. If you've worked in fast food, you will need to do at least that. I'll speak with other members of the board and get back to you. No problem, but, but know this, if we don't have a coherent solution by the end of this month, I am passing the responsibility of managing him over to you. Episode 6, Rat Race Adulthood People I grew up with are married and are now fully pledged parents. People I grew up with are in jail, creating huge emotional dents. My age mates are in university, getting their degrees. My age mates are famous, getting a handsome fee. My age mates are rising to the challenge and facing their fears. My age mates have set out to start real careers. My heroes have subconsciously revealed their many flaws. From my heroes, I now expect far much more. No matter how I deny it, it does me no good. So I've grown to accept I've entered the world of adulthood. While growing up under a thick cloud of oppression, depression and abuse, I always imagined as an adult rising from my beaten state as a successful career man that gained the respect of even my abusers. When I returned back to London, I was extremely eager to get a part-time job while I studied because I felt it was my chance to prove to all my abusers that I was a somebody. My first job was at Morelli's Cappuccino Bar, which was actually a nice job. My colleagues were nice, we got free food every night, and I learned how to make several styles of cappuccinos. The bar suddenly closed down and I was out of a job. My second job was with Argos, where I worked over the Christmas period. It was then the signs of the fact that the abuse I had, and was still going through, had an effect on me. One of the boys I worked there was a year older than me. He was mean to me one day, which caused me to go home and cry myself to sleep. I remember feeling so pathetic. During the following summer, I worked in McDonald's, which was horrible, as my manager constantly yelled and spoke down to me. I, in turn, had a mini breakdown and stormed out. I then did some work experience at the Bank of England, which was nice, but only for two weeks, and to be honest, wasn't really for me. I did some door-to-door -door sales, which I left after the first day and fighting off the desire to rip off the head of my supervisor. I then began to work in Tesco's, where I worked for four years. The job itself was good and secure, but I was constantly ridiculed because of my weight and made to generally feel like I was a no one. Feelings I blocked out and soldiered through. After university, I quit my job at Tesco's because I felt it would be a crutch preventing me from getting a job worthy of a graduate. Then I got a sales manager job in Matalan, which was horrible, as I experienced interaction from my manager and colleagues desired to make me feel like I was nothing. I remember my managers getting great joy from making my life miserable. This compounded the emotional turmoil I suppressed within me. I then got a job with Bid Up TV, which was a harsh work environment, which I dealt with by drinking and getting high on weed. I actually wanted to bring a bit of kindness to the environment, but I couldn't. I ended up giving the middle finger to my manager and walking out. Then I worked as a project coordinator for a program designed to help 16 year olds outside of mainstream education. I did a lot of good and overall, despite an unstable colleague, my work wasn't really that bad. But my post ran out of funding and I was unemployed once again. 
I then worked for Stagecoach, which seemed like a job that would allow me to turn it all around. It was well paying with free travel. But it was a horrible and toxic work environment where everyone was either a slave or a bully. Be it the bus drivers I managed, my colleagues or my managers. It was a horrible experience. Once again, I ended up giving my manager the middle finger and walking out. I then spent the following year holding weekly forums for young people in the area, where we debated and danced and had fun. I was unemployed and broke, so eventually I had to go back to work. I remember having a university student called over helping me out, because even though he thought I was a loser, saw the magic in what I had done. For the next four years, I did a lot of tempting as a youth development specialist, where I would go into four local authorities and do great work where well, plenty of young people would get inspired, but then after my great work, I would be let go like a piece of unwanted garbage. In 2010, I worked for Catch22 as a project coordinator for a youth development project. Again, doing great work that inspired young people and adults, but once again, I was harassed and ill-treated by a manager who found me threatening. The project ran out of funding and I took a year out to do some martial arts competitions, during which time I adopted two teenage boys. In 2013, I began working for a Christian charity that was designed to team up with churches to provide alternative education for troubled teens. Again, did some good work, but was constantly being backstabbed by Christian colleagues who would pray with me every morning. Then I got what I thought to be my dream job as a learning, enrichment and achievement manager in a Hackney primary school. It paid well and I could put all my skills, experience and giftings on display. This was my chance to make a long lasting mark, and I did. But a sociopathic head teacher, staff threatened by me, along with racist parents, put me through a campaign of harassment and bullying, which led to me being dismissed. I then started 2017 with two jobs. The first one being with a small company called Gateway, where I worked as a manager of a residential unit for teenagers leaving care. My manager's desire to undermine me and create an impossible work environment led to me resigning and focusing on my second job as a regional development manager for the National Osteoporosis Society where I lasted nine months because, simply put, I didn't fit into an environment that was both racist and sexist against male, uh, fake and generally uninteresting. My inability to hold on to a job meant I frequently visited the job center, which for me was humiliating on two fronts because firstly, it was like announcing to the world, hey, I'm unemployed just by walking in. And secondly, it seemed staff were encouraged to either speak down to you or just be uncooperative. Nothing says rock bottom like an unemployed man in his 30s who throws a tantrum in a job center. I remember feeling numb at 35 years old because I had no family, job, real money or any kind of success I could write home about. I had accepted that Kemi's predictions all those years ago had come true. I was a loser, at least by society's standards. Having said that, my faith meant I refused to tap out, which led to me getting a head of youth role for a South London charity where I ran and oversaw youth development initiatives delivered in a youth center and within schools. The board were very small-minded and were constantly undermining me. So after another year of great work, I find myself moving on to an organization that on paper seemed to be on the same page as I, but in real time ended up being incredibly racist. So after three months, I left with a tribunal war between me and them pending. I then found myself once again adding value to projects dedicated to young people in care. The funny thing about my career is that in between jobs, I would do short-term youth projects for little to no money. I would be extremely appreciated for the work I did, not only by the young people, but also by staff. It always broke my heart when I had to leave those jobs for practical reasons. But I always left inspired and encouraged by the fact that my calling to pastor, teach and inspire people was rock solid, regardless of who desires to hate and sabotage me. My Anime Life, Episode 6 the Serpent Doves, Oye's elite army of assassins, a group that embraced the notion that one size doesn't fit all. This is why they were able to cater to any target marked by their king. By the age of 18, Jay was already part of a two-man squad, which meant he was amongst the best of the best. Jay armed with two pistols and a katana blade, dressed in a black military type attire, leading a team of six attack bots, while his partner, Al, served as a sniper from a distance. Jay and Al were like family, but not in a typical happy memories type of way, but in a comrade that would die for you without hesitation type of way. In fact, other than going on missions, Al and Jay spent no time together. Like Jay, Al was a skilled and proven assassin, and for him, Killing was as natural as breathing. 
Jay, however, had an appreciation for life, which was unnatural for a Stone Cold killer. This is why he would always stand before his target unarmed, creating a moment that for him would reveal the true evil that resided in them. Every time Jay did this, the target in question would relentlessly attempt to take his life, forcing the assassin to utilize his training to complete the mission. This was the nature of every mission until the night before everything changed. Like every mission before, assassins had positioned themselves around the target's location, which in this case was a castle in the middle of a privately owned island. Jay's team of attack bots took out all manner of security, swiftly and clinically, before Jay finally presented himself unarmed before his target, who wasn't a highly skilled warrior of any kind, or some kind of low-life arm to the teeth. This can't be right, said Jay into his headset, as he stood before an eight-year-old girl, who was frozen with fear. Al, recognizing Jay's hesitation, shot the girl in the head from his position. After the mission, Jay found himself in a bar, staring into nothing. He had always been uncomfortable with the only identity he had truly embraced, but tonight he could no longer justify what he had sworn his allegiance to. A man like you who can't afford to dull his senses for even a second can only live vicariously through drunkards by mere observation, said the smartly dressed oriental looking man who looked like he was between 80 and 90 years old. Jay in turn didn't even acknowledge the man. This is a special herb that when taken in any form will, will give you the escape you seek as well as enhance you, which could be handy in your line of work, said the old man, placing a brown parcel on the table. Jay continued to ignore the man who in turn walked away. Eventually, Jay returned to his room with the parcel that the old man left him and sat on the mat that served as his bed. He opens the parcel and finds a strange looking purple plant. Jay, who was now in a strange state of mind, used the plant to create a soup, which he drank. At first, Jay felt nothing. Then suddenly, he was transported through time, space and many realms beyond man's comprehension. Only to awake the next morning with no memory of where he had been and annoying that unknown elements of his mind and body had been unlocked. Dressed only in a pair of black trousers, Jay stepped into the courtyard of where he lived, only to be surrounded by an army, which he instantly knew was made up of 320 armed men. Your king is on the run, and all your comrades have either sworn their allegiance to me or have been executed, said a slim middle-aged Caucasian man, dressed up like a five-star general, as he stood on the top of a tank about 20 meters from where Jay stood. His name was Hannibal Smith, Oya's head of security, who had successfully executed a coup d'etat. I am uninterested in your world. If you let me be, I'll let you be, responded Jay, now only concerned with getting and staying on a moral path. Despite the fact that his new state of being meant combat-wise, the men that stood before him grasped mathematics at the level of a toddler, while he had far exceeded the best mathematicians mankind had to offer. It's going to be a problem, said the new king, prompting six of his armed men to line up in front of Jay and point their weapons at him. But before they could pull the trigger, Jay disarmed all six men, knocked them out and got beside Hannibal, took the pistol from his holster and pointed it at the new king's head. Think about what just happened and carefully decide your next move, said Jay calmly. Falling Short Complete Series can be found on Jumash Studios' YouTube channel. Falling Short is also available in paperback book format or on Kindle. To get your copy, email jumashstudios at gmail.com. That's jumashstudios at gmail.com.